Should be getting started here in a second, guys. Appreciate your patience. Welcome to anybody that just joined. Oh, lovely. YouTube popped up an ad. Hey, you can just let it let it roll while we wait for a second here. Uh, Eric here, Mr. Fired Up Wealth. I'm going to basically just do a impromptu live stream. We usually do these in Discord, um, the, uh, the Fired Up Wealth Patreon community. Just going to try one here, do a public one live. Going to go through some general information about fear and greed, how treasuries impact stocks, recap of the week, talk a little bit about some of our favorite growth stocks, some ARK ETFs. Just have a good time. Maybe look at some charts later on, some technical analysis and see where we're at and where we might uh, we might go. I mean, you can see that we had a little bit of a sell-off towards the end of the day. Not really a sell-off, but it was uh, it was up a lot more and it kind of backed off. So the NASDAQ actually closed up 0.56%. The S&P was up 0.48%. And the Dow Jones was actually down 1.5%. So, uh, you know, some turbulence this week. Not real surprising, I guess, uh, based on what's going on. How, how does everything sound? How does this, everything sound good, guys? I, I have this other screen over here so I can kind of see what your comments are. This setup should work pretty good. It's my first try, but let me know if everything uh, sounds good. I'm not in Discord at all, so I'm just in this chat room here on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, so fear and greed. Are you guys familiar with uh, with fear and greed and how all that works? If someone could let me in, know in that chat room that I sound good, you can hear me and see me, that'd be super awesome. So fear and greed, you know, that tells us really what's driving the market in terms of emotion. It's kind of the fear gauge to, to measure sentiment. And there's seven different things that the fear and greed index measures. So you've got things like the junk bond demand. And this here says extreme greed. And it's actually probably surprising to you maybe that the fear and greed index is actually a 56 in the greed. You, you might think that maybe we're in fear because a lot of us have growth stocks. Sound is very good. Sounds good. Hey, guys. Welcome. We're, this is casual. Hope you have a beer. Kick back. Relax. We'll have some questions and stuff later. I'm just going to go through some stuff that I think will be helpful. If this is recap, just, you know, chat away with some friends and have a good time, drink some beer, whatever. Um, but the fear and greed. So it's really looking at seven different indicators. It's going to look at the junk bond demand. Right now, that's at greed. It was actually at extreme greed. Um, it actually was extreme greed here, right here. It says last change February 25th. I want to update this to this to make sure. Okay. So we're at 55. And you've got a, a junk junk bond is greed. The you know the stock price strength is greed. You got safe haven demand greed. Stock price breadth is greed. Market volatility is neutral, and that was actually extreme fear on the twenty fifth. So maybe we're starting to see a bottom. The VIX actually was down to about twenty five, twenty six point five eight. It was closer to thirty, so it did have a little bit of a a cool off there. Now, February, February is usually not a very good month anyway for stocks. And we typically, if you've noticed, we've had kind of a blow off at the end of each month. Well, guess what? This is the last day of the month. So Monday, maybe it's a, a new day. But, you know, we were frothy. It wasn't surprising at all to see a sell off. And treasury yields is really what kind of set it off. When the market runs hot like that, it really does look for any excuse at all. And the excuse really is going to be, most people tell you, the treasury yields and that 10-year treasury bond yield creeping up to that 1.5 range and even a little bit higher. So I'll get to that in a second and explain the correlation between treasury bonds, uh, you know, interest rates and how that impacts stocks, especially growth stocks in a second. So to the moon, uh, that shirt is popping. Yeah, I figured, you know, it's Friday. I figured I would, uh, I would lighten the mood. And, you know, you know, I... I, I was I was gonna say something. I'm not sure if I could say it on YouTube, so I, I stopped myself. The people in Discord, though, I'm cheating. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, putting call options is extreme fear. Now, if you look at this, this is interesting. I think so. This is fear and greed over time. Let me zoom in, in case you're on a phone. You should be able to see this real nice. So you can see. So 2019, we went way down to this extreme fear, down to you know past the 20 line here. We did it again, March 20, uh, 2020, when we had the, you know, the big sell-off. It went down and retested that same greed line. I think this, uh, this volatility index has been around since maybe 2012, so it hasn't been around forever, but it measure, measures volatility. And you can see right now we're actually you know, 55, 56. We're sitting up here. You would think maybe, based on some of our portfolios, maybe if we're in a lot of growth, 
you would think maybe we're down here somewhere like, oh my goodness. And I, the reason I show this to you is that, you know, it could get a lot worse and I, I, I don't want it to get worse, but it's important to understand as an investor what could happen. And of course we're running, we're still running about 10% over the, uh, the 200 day moving average on the QQQ. So that means, you know, if you follow technicals and, you know, like we have a masterclass series on Discord. You can watch the last video is uh, number six, the sixth video. It's about an hour video on technical analysis. And it talks about using trend lines, moving averages, RSIs, and how a lot of stocks will come back to those 200-day moving averages. You know, some growth stocks will go closer to the 100-day. And then you've got things like the EMA, the exponential moving average. You've got the SMA, the simple moving average. And some growth stocks run a little faster, so EMA. But, you know, the point being is that stocks were running hot way above those moving averages. And they always like to cool back and kind of come back down to a mean. If you look at trend lines, trend lines are really handy because it kind of shows you the direction the stock wants to go. And algorithms, here's the thing about the market. You know, algorithms drive the stock market. Algorithms are programmed by humans. And algorithms are programmed by humans that use historical data. So history repeats itself. And it basically, it, you know, that's, that rings true. And it's only going to be more and more true as more and more algo trading happens through machines. So keep that in mind. Technicals are important, even as you know, someone like me, I'm a long-term investor. You know, the fundamentals are most important. You know, you look at the uh, quantitative and the qualitative analysis. You kind of use the technicals to get better entry and exit points, and we'll go over some of that here in a little bit. So, uh, what's going on, guys? I'm glad that you guys were able to to make it. Um, we got we got a, uh, we got quite a crew here, so I appreciate you guys joining. I heard Reddit is going to send. CCIV to 300. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, may, maybe. It seems like they've got the power to do that with some of those names. Uh, the shirt is popping to the moon. Super dope shirt. Glad to be here. Hey, Blake. So um, let's, let's take a look at real quick. This is a little bit, you know, maybe boring for some, but it's important to understand this stuff. So I'll try to put it in, you know, I'll, I'll try to make it really, you know, straightforward and not, not bore you to death with a long explanation. So this is a Reuters article that's talking about the correlation between treasury bond yields and, and stocks, especially growth stocks. So recently we had this treasury auction and the auction was pretty, pretty sloppy. Today, actually, it kind of stabilized, which is a good thing. But rates have been moving today. This was from yesterday, the 10-year and the five-year yields have been rising throughout the day. The market's really focused on the interest rate world right now, what they're saying uh, and how fast that they're moving. The auction had a big tail to it. There was not a lot of demand for these bonds. He said, as a result, the 10-year yield and the five-year started spiking. That was yesterday around one, and people were selling bonds. So when, when yields rise rapidly, that scares the stock market. And a low interest rate, which we've had for several you know, years, last couple of years, especially um, in a low interest rate world, a lot of big names and popular stocks do well. So a lot of the people in here probably buy some of these names, these growth stocks, the high PE stocks. Um, and, and basically those do well. When rates rise, those stocks go out of favor. In my experience, that's true, but people always come back to growth because that's where you make the money. The, the key is focusing on quality, you know, trying to find companies that have you know, and actually a good balance sheet that can prove a story of growth if they're not, you know, having earnings yet. You know, the, one, the companies with earnings obviously are going to be better, but some of the growth stocks that we invest in, like in the SaaS world, they might, uh, you know, have really extreme growth rates, but, you know, maybe like a CrowdStrike, maybe it doesn't have um, earnings yet, but you can see a growth story where it can grow into it. Uh, rising rates is kicking off a rotation from those hot popular tech names. Here we go, right? ARC, you know, disruptive technology into cyclicals, banks, and energy. Well, that's the value trade. And we've talked about this for a long time in our Discord group about, you know, having a barbell, trying to have a little bit of diversification. You know, I love the, the tech stocks and the, and the fun growth names as much as everybody, but I also like to balance that out a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's up to you. It depends on your risk tolerance, you know, how you build a portfolio. I talk about building a blueprint, a blueprint so that you can, you know, if you're going to build a house, you need a blueprint. And just like a portfolio, you, you build the blueprint or you make the blueprint so you can build the house. You can't just take pieces of wood and lumber and just start putting them anywhere. You need to know where those, where those materials are going to go to build a house. It's the same thing with a portfolio. You know, and it's funny because even people that are in the group, we've got a channel in Discord that's about portfolio growing or, 
uh, portfolio, um, basically development and creation. And we have questions all the time, like, Hey, I've got this. And you know, you, you point out like, well, Hey, what's your blueprint? Oh, okay. Well, my blueprint is I want 20% DGIF dividend growth investing for fired. That's total growth type names that have dividend that increases each year plus stock appreciation. You know, they want 20%. And you say, well, wait a minute, Costco is, you know, these five stocks are 30% of your portfolio. So, and those, those five stocks are, are DGIF. So now you're categorizing those stocks and you're putting in your bucket. You're like, wait a minute, you're already 10% over just on the DGIF. So address that, you know, you go through the, the list of stocks you own and you try to put it into the portfolio and make sure it fits your blueprint. And it can be tricky, of course, because, you know, you're not just buying everything on one, one day. It's not a board game where you just put it together in a day. A portfolio takes time to build. You know, it takes time to, you know, to figure out the plan of what you want and, uh, and the risk tolerance involved in all those things. But basically, uh, where I was going with that is, you know, the tech names are, are going to, you know, have a sell-off. Now, usually they, they, they find their footing and, and bounce back. But, you know, eventually, what we're talking about right now are treasury bond yield rates. Now, the Fed has promised to keep interest rates low. When the Fed starts increasing interest rates, which they've promised they won't do for a couple of years, but if they change their mind or we get two years from now and they start raising the rates, you know, keep that in mind when you're growing your portfolio that that can affect it now and it can affect it later with different types of interest rates and how they affect your, your growth stocks and your high PE type stocks. So the bond market's starting to look like a different landscape. There will be more interest rate hikes in 2023, kind of what I was alluding to which is pretty far away, but not too far away, right? A lot of equities have gone up too much too fast. We'll look at some moving averages and some technicals, and you'll see what I mean here in a minute. There's a concept that despite the Fed is saying they're not going to do anything about interest rates, a level of inflation might get away from the Fed. This is something to pay attention to and to, to be aware of, and that will have a market impact. The Fed's policy should be a calming message, but because of the amount of supply, treasury debt, the market is beginning to interpret that it, that as much as much more stimulus without potential of a check of of discipline, the fear in excess could develop in the meantime that twist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, it you know basically what this comes down to though is the interest rates go up, and the growth stocks, the high P names, you know will get hit and they'll go down. You know if you look at um, some of these other comments. It's really related to the treasury action. We had an auction for seven-year treasuries, which was quite, um, which really was quite underbid, which is obviously not good, and that caused the ten-year ten-year uh, treasury yields generally a steeper curve to permeate very quickly. That really just shocked the market. There's a lot of concerns about inflation becoming a little too high, and becoming a headwind, especially for tech stocks. Back to Arc, right? The market was stretched. A lot of forward growth expectations have been baked in. And that's creating some of the excuse I mentioned earlier to blow off steam for investors that were maybe a little bit too bullish. So we were running hot. We knew we were going to have a sell-off. Interest rates climb up a little bit, and it gives you a good excuse. The other thing to keep in mind is when you look at the, uh, the S&P, and I can just tell you this off the top of the head without reading it, you know, some investors are looking for yield. They've got enough wealth. They're not trying to necessarily grow it. They're trying to just kind of pace or outpace inflation slightly. And when the S&P 500 yield becomes less than, say, the 10-year Treasury yield, that can actually make an impact on supply and demand for equities, for stocks. So that's something to keep in mind as well. I'm going to take a break here and see what questions we have. Stimulus will save the market next week, I believe. It certainly can't hurt, right? What are your top three stocks, if you don't mind? Um, the Discord is truly unmatched, highly recommended. Yeah, I mean, top three stocks, it depends on, you know, the day. I mean, um, that's something that, you know, every day I'm, I'm giving updates of what I'm buying and selling in the, uh, the Discord. And the channel's kind of got a lot of them. I mean, I like stocks. like The thing is, is like CrowdStrike was a high conviction stock, but I was telling the Discord team, you know, at $100 and $130 or Cloudflare at $32. I still like those stocks, but I don't necessarily like them even, even at the prices now. They've come down, and I still like the stocks, but I would much rather get in those stocks early. That's what I'm always trying to do is find the next one before it runs. And, you know, it's, you're not perfect every time, but that's what you're trying to do. Once I got a full position, that's a long-term hold now. I've got, you know, CrowdStrike. I've got Cloudflare. 
you know, and I'm, I'm holding those stocks, you know, long term and I'm trying to find the next ones. That's kind of what I'm doing, you know, with this whole channel and especially with the Patreon group. So, you know, if that's something you're interested, check out Discord. I'm not going to push it too hard. I mean, we've got uh, 250 patrons in there now and, you know, we've got lots of activity and it's a good group. But, you know, for, for people that might be interested in that, definitely check it out. So what I want to look at right now is I want to look at ARC and I'm going to go through all the top holdings for each ETF because you'd be surprised, you know, it's an actively managed ETF. So these, these holdings change all the time. And I always say to the team, like, I don't want, I don't like it when people are just buying and selling based off of those emails you get from ARC, you know, try to get into some of the names before arc is because you're catching the most of the gains you know if you're just going to follow every move arc does i mean you know and, and i have some too arc etfs but you know put your money in arc etfs i've got the way i do it if you're not familiar is i do my retirement is all in etfs and then i've got uh one and a half million dollar you know taxable brokerage uh, main one that i basically trade in. i've got some more in a taxable bro taxable brokerage that's etfs but the main portfolio is about 1.5 million dollars it was higher of course it's kind of come back a little bit um, but that one, it has mostly individual stocks, it has a handful of ETFs, but it's very, very minimal percentage wise. Most of my retirement is going to be in ETFs. And I have a mix of some ARC ETFs, you know, lit PBW, even some VU. I've got, you know, some conservative stuff in there too, emerging markets, some Chinese technology, things like that. But I've got a really good global balance in there, about 20% international stocks. And, um, it's really mostly ETFs. The reason for that is in your retirement, you can't tax loss harvest. So, you know, I would rather take my risk through something like an ARC in my retirement and then invest in the individual names that I can tax loss harvest and I can, you know, have, have fun with on my, uh, my taxable brokerage. So that's what a lot of people like to do. You know, it's really up to you how you do it. Um, back to over here. We've got, we've got a lot of activity. I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, Got some cheerleading going on. Gotta love that. Uh, what are your thoughts on Eva? I don't know that one. I'm sorry. Um, are you interested in drone companies? I am, but there's not a whole lot of them that catch my eye. There, um, there was an ETF that I was in for a while, made some good money on and sold it. Um, I can't even remember what it was called anymore. I probably sold it last year sometime. That was a, in retirement. Um, but yeah, I definitely... You know, definitely interested in the topic, but I'm I'm not like I don't have any individual names that um, that I'm in or anything like that. Uh, so okay, so this is just A R K K. Now the top ten holdings, Tesla has always for the longest time has been you know a top holding. Now I've been in Arc ETFs for a while. Um, most of them were about 2016, 17. So I can't remember when these were formed. Like the first one was this is the first one. It was shortly after. Um, you know, I, they've been around for several years, but I've been in them for a few years and they've done well, of course. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things again, though, I like to have them in my retirement, you know, whatever you do is up to you. It's totally fine. Um, just realize if you have an taxable brokerage that it's actively managed, they're buying and selling every day and you will have some tax ramifications. If you don't have a huge account or a huge amount of shares of, of the ARC funds, then it's probably not much of a worry, but it's something just to keep in mind that there will be tax ramifications when they buy and sell short-term capital gains and things like that. Distributions, like the way a mutual fund used to be back in the day. If, if you're, you know, my age, <laughs> a lot of you probably aren't. Um, so Tesla, Roku, Square, Teladoc, and Teladoc's actually the largest holding in Arc G, which is interesting because it was CRISPR for a while, and I'll show you that here in a second. Um, Baidu, Spotify, Zillow. I've been a bull in Zillow for a little while. You know, CRISPR's in this one at, at the uh, the spot there towards the bottom. And then you got MVTA and you got Shopify. So what's your guys' favorite out of the, out of this top 10 here? What's your favorite? It'd be interesting. They're all good. I mean, they're all good. They all have pros and cons. It's pretty diversified. That's the nice thing about the ARKK is it has a little bit of everything in there. So uh, am I bullish on Fiverr? So if you look at the channel, I did a video on Fiverr when it was first IPO'd, when nobody talked about it. It was like 26 bucks. I bought Fiverr. I wrote it up. I sold it. I probably sold a little bit too soon, but I did make good money on it. And I like the company a lot. There's there's two or three names that I like in that space, but it's just really hard to, to reach at the valuation um, on it. 
is this the right moment to buy CRM? I like CRM personally. You know, when I give you my opinion, it's just my opinion. I, I'm not a financial advisor. I can't tell you what to do. I can give you information. I think 225 or under on, on Salesforce, it might, you know, me personally, I think that's not a bad opportunity. You pretty much know they're, they're, they're telling you 20%, you know, growth. They've got decent margins. Obviously, right now, the stock is, you know, it was on fire. But as soon as they announced that they're going to buy Slack, you know, that's a lot of money. Some people don't like that. They doubt the fact that, you know, CRM is going to be able to incorporate that business, you know, in, 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 into Salesforce. But here's the thing, and I have a video on Salesforce in the channel. It's like 30 minutes and it goes into a lot of good detail. I've been in Salesforce stock for a long time. You know, um, we think of Mark Benioff. He came from Oracle. I, I, I worked at Oracle as well. Larry, uh, Larry Ellison was his mentor. That was the CEO when I was at Oracle. Still obviously very involved, the founder of Oracle. He's like the COO or something now. But, um, you know, the point being, you know, it, it, the, the leadership, in my opinion, is, is very good. The culture is very good. Um, it's a great company. It's a great product. It has a moat. You know, it's in a great space with software as a service. They're diversified. If you understand what MuleSoft does in Tableau, so they got the analytics side of it. And I think that Slack can actually integrate well into that ecosystem. And I think that they can cross sell. If you're not familiar with my background, if you're new, just kind of found found this by chance, and you're like, who's this guy? Uh, I retired basically self-employed. This is what I do now. I retired the last November, but I was in software for about a decade. I worked at Oracle and then I worked at a couple other vendors. And towards the end, I was doing um, IaaS and PaaS, so infrastructure and platform as a service. I was basically doing lift and shift and move and improve, taking um, legacy ERP systems and moving those into the cloud. So um, that's kind of the background and a lot of my specialty and you know the stocks that I I tend to invest in and I do well in are you know a lot of them are in that SaaS kind of software as a service enterprise technology space. Um, so that's that's kind of my my sweet spot. You know, obviously disruptive technology as a whole. I spent a lot of time researching on, but um, you know SaaS is really kind of um, my specialty area, I guess. If, if if I were to to name a favorite and where I have the most, you know experience and time and, <laughs> and interest. I get, I get excited and I get riled up you can check out the channel. There's tons of videos. There's a couple IPOs coming out, Databricks and UiPath that are both kind of in the cloud SaaS space that you might want to check out as well. I think those will be good IPOs. They're probably going to be expensive, you know, just like Snowflake and a lot of them have been, but uh, check that out. Uh, what else we got here? Um, I want to make this interactive, but also educational and make this kind of casual. So uh, David Hammer, Upwork, Better Valuation. I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a good one to check out. There's a few in that space I, I mentioned earlier. I'll give you one guess at which one is my favorite. I bet you it's Tesla. Uh, are you <laughs> bullish on Palantir? What are your thoughts? I, I believe I was the first person to do a video on Palantir on Facebook. We bought it in Discord at $9. So everybody that's in here talking about Discord probably owns it and probably are really happy with it but I have been telling them for a while that it's a $25 stock and to not buy it at 35 and $45. And it actually broke 25 and is below that, but I think it's a $25 stock and it gets easily to act. And it probably rallies from there. The thing about it, don't underestimate the power of a cult stock. You know, look at Tesla. Tesla is, is, is the poster child of how we as retail investors can rally behind a company and fuel them and exponentially help them grow faster and get the money they need, the capital they need to build and to grow and to be successful and to get in the S&P 500 for God's sake. So, um, you know, I think Palantir has a lot of that, you know, a lot of us retail uh, folks are behind it. So it's probably an opportunity below 25. Um, I don't like reaching more than that. And, and, and this remember too, if you buy it at $22, there's a lot of people in this room that own it at nine. So, you know, it's still up, you know, a couple hundred percent or two, three hundred percent. And there's a lot of people that have it. And there's a lockup coming. OK, there's a lockup coming in March. And we, I, I shared this information the other day in one of the top Eric's portfolio channels in Discord. But there's like multi-billion billions of shares. The reason the price, the, the stock price is what it's at is because there's so many shares outstanding. 
And those shares outstanding, there's a lot of shares that are owned by uh, insiders. And those insiders, you know, they opened that IPO at 10, it was a direct listing. They opened it at $10 to the public and it actually dropped into like the high eights. The reason it dropped in the high eights is because the system, the clearinghouse that they were using for some of the insiders to sell, they could sell a certain percentage the first day. That system failed and they weren't able to sell. It actually drove the price down and then by the, you know, it, it, it screwed it all up basically. So it gave you some opportunity there. But long and short of it, be careful with Palantir because I am bullish on Palantir and I like Palantir. I liked Palantir a lot at $10 and less. It's not that I don't like it at $22, but just remember that when that lockup, the expiration lockup on those shares happen, there are a lot of shares and they own it at a lot less than the $10 and uh, you know initial offering. So you know there's there's a lots of insiders that have it for half that price and under. So if, if it's at twenty three dollars and all of a sudden they can sell it, it's at twenty five bucks, and they, they they own it at four or five dollars. There's probably going to be some selling. The question is, is how many people are going to be buying on their end? It's all supply and demand. But you have to be aware of that as an investor, that that's the risk. If you're buying it even at these levels, that it has upside risk long term, but it's going to have potential gyrations here in the next month because of that that lockup period. So make sure you understand that when you're when you're messing with these these newly public companies. All right. So I watch your videos. Stock picks are great, man. Thanks for your picks. James Long's a VIP member, and he's trying to be nice. I appreciate it, James. <laughs> um, VIP James. Um, Anthony, another VIP member. Great to see many familiar names. Luis Z and Teladoc, of course. Been in both of those. Teladoc, I did a video before the pandemic. I said it was a buy on $100. The pandemic made it a little bit... Uh, lucky in that sense. Zillow Group, uh, I think I'm up 500% on that one. Um, you know, it's expensive here. So we can look at a chart later if you want. Uh, Stephen Connors deleted his message. He must have been swearing or dropping cucumbers. Uh, ben V, number one dividend growth stock. I mean, what's with these tough questions? Like, come on, man. I have a lot of them. It, the, you know, you put, you put somebody on the spot and say, what's your favorite stock? And then if it's wrong, they come back and say, oh, you said it was this. I like Apple. Um, the thing is, is the, the problem with that question is the answer of the question, I already own the stock at a lot less. So if the question is, what's your favorite dividend growth investing stock to buy today? I would need some time to answer that because I don't know. I'd have to go, I'd actually have, have to go research that because I'm not buying any of those right now. Um, I, I guess I'll tell you I'm buying Dollar General, but it wouldn't be my favorite stock because I know what the upside risk of Dollar General is, or, or not the risk, but the downside risk. It's very limited downside risk from this price point, but I know what the upside is too. And it's, you know, it's not a growth stock. So, you know, are you looking for a DGI stock that's going to pay income, you know, which is what we call an income stock in Fired Up Wealth? Or are you looking for a DGIF, the dividend growth investing for fired where it's total growth? Or are you looking for, you know, a DGI stock that's just going to, you know, give you dividend growth and you're not, you know, not as concerned about the appreciation of the share price. So it's a, it's a multifaceted question, I guess. Uh, I am honest, Eric. I don't see Palantir. I don't see Palantir. We're not looking at Palantir. Are you talking about ARC? I think Palantir is a question. Let's move on to the next one here. Um, so next one is ARC Q. This is the, the technology and robotics ETF. And this one, we've got Tesla again at the top, 10.13%. Uh, you got Baidu at 5.9%, Deer and Company. This is one that we talked about a lot in the group, never pulled the trigger, but it's, it's made a huge run. Uh, Trimble, JD, Kratos, Teradyne, that's a, a top pick from the group from last year going into this year. We've got a channel called uh, like the Elite Top Picks, so all the members kind of basically say, here's my favorite pick for 2021. Uh, Alphabet, NXP uh, Semiconductors, there you go, Derek, NX, NXP, and Komatsu. Um, you know, there's some names in there that I like a lot. This one, you know, this is my least favorite arc, but it doesn't mean it's not good. Mine, you know, I'm biased, but my favorite is ARCW simply because I understand the space the best. It's the next generation ETF. It's actually interesting because 
Bitcoin is not, you know, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is 4.85% at number two now. Tesla, again, is number one. You got Square, Teladoc, Roku, Spotify. You're seeing a lot of the same names, right? Twitter, Tencent, Netflix, okay? Then we've got ArcG. This is one of my favorites. I bought some of this in my Roth today. Um, Teladoc is number one, which a lot of people might be surprised because Teladoc wasn't number one. We were buying Teladoc back in that $180 range um, last year. And, you know, made a nice run. It's made a nice pullback too, but still bullish on that one. It's now the number one holding in ArcG. And then you got Exact Sciences. You got Regeneron, Pacific Biosciences. That's a fired up wealth favorite. I don't own it, but there's several members. Uh, Dorian uh, uh, was the first person I think that bought it. And a few people um, have, have bought that one and done really well. Twist is one that I did buy, uh, buy around $60, $65. Bucks, and that's done really well. That Roche Holdings, Vertex, Novartis, Cardex, and uh, this is uh, Takeda, I think is how you say that last one. So I'll do this last one, and I'll go back to any questions over here. And I'm going to look at some charts. So I bought some of this today in my, my Roth, too. This is Arc F. This is the FinTech. So Square is their top holding. That got hit pretty hard after earnings. Um, you know, I've actually been in Square since 2017 at $54, so... Um, you know, I've been bullish on that one for a while. Of course, a lot of the stocks have been bullish on, you know, the pandemic helped them, you know, they would have gotten to where they are now, but it would have taken a lot longer. So it expedited a lot of these, these names, of course, um, kind of add that, that fuel to the fire. You, you hear the thing, like, you know, we had two years of two years of, um, you know, growth basically in two months. And it was pretty true in a lot of these, these SaaS names and these work from home kind of um, you know, next gen internet type names and things like that. So, you know, in fact, I, you know, all these individual stocks, I own Square, PayPal, Zillow. I don't own Pinterest, but I do like it. I don't own international. Um, there's Tencent, Silvergate, C, C Limited. We have lots of Singapore groups uh, or Singapore people in the group members. I think there's 15 plus members or, you know, a lot of members in there. But, um, you know, that was actually brought to us from the Singapore group. If you're not familiar with C, that is a Singapore based company. So we were able to get in that a little bit earlier than a lot of the masses It had already gone up, you know, quite a bit, but we got into that one last year and it's done pretty well. Shopify of course has done great. It started as a weed play for me when I first got into it, um, you know, with the, the cannabis stocks and then it's kind of evolved into a lot, something much different, of course, with the whole, um, the last, you know, year's worth of events. And then Melly, a lot of people uh, like this one a lot. I like the stock, never did buy it. I've got, you know, exposure to it, of course, in the ETFs. But you can see, and we'll get a chart here in a minute, but you can see, you know, we've got a nice pullback on these names. My face is red. Must be from this. It's Red Bull, though, so, we're, you know, we're good. What do we got? Um... The problem is that everything is overvalued, even value stocks, IMO. There's always, there's always opportunity in individual names, in my opinion. I, I, I see what you're saying, and I agree. A lot of things are expensive, but there are definitely some opportunities you know, out there. And, and that's, that's the whole goal, goal of the group is we're trying to find those opportunities. And we do a great job. There's a lot of smart people in there. Um, Eduardo, uh, a little position on Baba. What do you think about Baba? I think it's... I think it's good. Um, the channel's awesome. Thank you. Can you elaborate why Pinterest is an ARC F? I actually don't know because I don't own Pinterest. But um, I'm sure that you could uh, do some Googling on that and, and find the answer. But it must have something to do with, you know, the, the fact that they're incorporating some sort of financial technology. But I don't, you know, I have, a, I have an out card on that one since I don't have the individual stock. <laughs> Um, I haven't done the due diligence to know the answer. Um, let's look at, this is just, let me, let me do something real quick. You're going to see my OSB, but that's okay. That should be better. I'll take an intermission here. So you should still see my, my camera, but now bottom left, right? I'm going to take a break here and say, oh man, I'm sorry. This wasn't supposed to be up there. I'll remove those, my bad. That like button and that subscribe button weren't supposed to be on there, so I'll take those off. I apologize for that. 
But uh, please do like and subscribe. <laughs> See, those are I've got this stream deck, and I can just hit the like button. And there's a little bit of lag from like from my, like right now. There's probably a 15 second lag from when I actually say something, and on the camera, so you actually see it. But I hit that like button, and it took 15 seconds. But uh, it's kind of cool. You can like you can all, do all kinds of cool stuff with this thing. Um, let's go back. Hawaiian Eric. That's right. I, it's Friday. It's happy hour. Um, I'm cheating today. And actually joining in on happy hour, so you know why not? Um, I've had a I've had a really busy 2021 so far. I think it's been pretty good. We've done a lot of good work in the uh, group, and we've put out six masterclass videos so far. We do a daily live stream every morning. We do two on Fridays. Um, try to do at least one to two YouTube videos a week. We also do chart days on Wednesday where we go through charts like I'm going to do right now, and then just you know constant due diligence and sharing with the team and collaborating in discord it's it's amazing how much you know energy goes into that and how great the team is to be able to like work together and you know to make that whole machine work because obviously i'm like the coach and the mentor but like it doesn't work without a team you know um so we've we've put together a great community there and i'm i'm real happy with it and you know the growth has been perfect you know it's very controlled we're not trying to like get thousands of people in there or anything like that it's just trying to keep the quality high um tesla is a 10 bagger for me i didn't realize that you had tesla you you seriously own tesla when did you buy tesla at what price that's great congratulations i never would have guessed that because usually the only stocks you're interested in are you said you understand food and i, I can't remember what you said the other day but um, Bob is a great company business wise. I have some of it too. Yeah. Um, thoughts on Wells Fargo. I hate the company, so I can't buy the stock. I bank with them still. And I, I, I can't wait to not bank them anymore. Um, ARC ETF. And I, that's important to me. Um, you know, I like to like the, the product or the company as a user or consumer. And if I don't, it's hard for me to really get behind them. I owned the stock for a while and sold it. And luckily I sold it at, I think I sold it at 55. What is that thing at now? So if you remember in 2018, that before the Super Bowl, we had that sell off. I mean, it's, it's not even back to what I sold it at. Am I right on that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Let's look at a five year chart. Yep. I sold it right. So the top was 65 and I missed that. Things started going to heck. I can't swear because we're, we're not on Discord. Um, and I sold it right here at like 55 bucks. And it's never, you know, you had a chance to get to 58 here. But since basically 2018, it has not gotten back. It got in November of 19, it got back to 54. So just under that. But, you know, it's been two years basically. And it's $20 from $30 from its high. Maybe it recovers, you know, you know, if you, if you've done a lot of due diligence on it and you feel like it's a recovery play, it could be a recovery play. If you study, um, Peter Lynch video, number five of the masterclass goes through Peter Lynch and his methodologies. You can also read one up on wall street. It's a great book, but he talks about those type of, of stocks are called recovery stocks. And you would buy a stock like Wells Fargo. If you've done the homework to say they're, they're coming out of the, the darkness and they're going to go back to all-time highs. And what you would do is you'd buy it when it's suppressed and try to get ahead of the masses, and you would ride the stock back up to those levels, and then you would sell it. And that's, that's what he would teach. And I generally am buy, buy and hold long-term, but if I'm playing something like Wells Fargo and I want to take the emotion out of it, like I don't really like it, but I'm going to play it as a swing from a technical level, then I'm, and I'm, think, I'm, putting with my, I'm thinking with my trader hat and not my investor hat. And I do you know, have this long-term portfolio and then I've got a trading account. So I do both. Um, the trading account's much smaller and I'm very disciplined with how I manage it and everything and the amount of money in it and all that. So if you were playing Wells Fargo, you know, that's how I would probably pay it, play it, you know, unless you had a really bullish case from the fundamentals that it was going to be this, you know, multi-year recovery story. That's, that's possible, but I just don't know enough about them. Um, cool. So let's see. Um, Adobe is a good stock. I like that one. I've, I've got a decent amount of that one. Um, Boozy is a disruptive AR technology company. 
Thoughts on IPOE? Uh, I like that one. Uh, agree with you on Wells Fargo. Just need my mortgage paid off now to get rid of them. Okay. So let's, this is what we do on Wednesdays. It's called Chart Day. So every Wednesday in Discord, before a market opening, you go into Discord and you type in a ticker and we go through different stocks. Now, we're not doing that necessarily right now because I'm going to go through the stocks that I want to share with you because that's what we're going to do first. And if there's time, we'll look at some other ones. Um, so what, what I'm going to do, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to look at ARC and I'm going to look at a few of them and kind of show you some moving averages. So if you're, not, if you're new to technicals, you know, there's a lot of different indicators and oscillators. It can be very confusing and overwhelming. And really the, the, fun, the foundation of technicals is, is they're very simple. And it comes really down to three main things. And of course, there's millions of oscillators and indicators that you can use. Millions is hyperbolic, but hundreds. The RSI, okay, the RSI basically just shows you if something's overbought or oversold. If you get over 70, it's running a little hot. If you get under 30, you know, it's pretty much oversold. So when you get down to the 30s, and, and there's no magic wand. Like if it hits 32.3, it's a buy no matter what. No, I mean, this thing can go all the way to zero. It goes from zero to 100. But generally, when you start to get closer to that 30, it's pretty washed out. And then you use the information with other tools, kind of what I always say, a toolbox. And so the next thing I would look at is I'd say, okay, I want to buy ARC but I, I, what price should I buy it at? We know it's expensive still, even after it's come down, it's come down almost 20% from its highs. And I'll show you a chart in a minute, but it's, it's trading at $130 right now. It's actually down uh, post-market, which is always interesting, $130. Now there was somebody on CNBC today that said she was bullish on ARC. She was in it and she sold it in December at around the range it's at now. And she would buy it back again at $100. <laughs> I don't, is it possible? Sure. I don't think it's probably going to go to hundred dollars, but anything's possible because March 20, if you, you know, I use March 2020 because a lot of people experienced it, but March 2020 is just one example of many where you've had massive sell-offs. I was also involved, you know, I've been investing in for over 20 years. So I was part of the dot-com crash. I was part of the 2000, 2000 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And then, you know, there, there's several other smaller ones, you know, even 2018 had its share of, of issues. There was the, the Christmas sale of 2018, December 24th. And you just, you just remember those days. Um, you know, one of, one, one of the worst days in the, in the history of NASDAQ was my birthday, things like that. So you look at this and say 130 bucks. Okay. So 130 bucks. So the moving averages, so the EMA, the exponential moving average, to put it simplistically, it's just, it's a little bit faster moving. The moving averages uses the, the prior day close and it gives you basically an average number. There's a formula a calculation algorithm that you can use to do it, but it's not necessary. You can get the information. This is trading view. You can get a free account or I've got a pro account, but you don't have to have a pro account. You can just get a free account. You can get all this information for free. So you're looking, you know, you can ignore all this stuff down here. Um, looking at the RSI. Okay. 35. It's getting pretty close to getting sold down. You know, again, it's at 130 bucks. Okay, so the EMA 10 is 141. The simple moving average is 144, 143. So where are we at? Okay, well, we didn't quite hit the, and I have to look at a chart to see what the low was, but the 100 day moving average is basically 122 to 125. So we're in that range. To get to the 200 day moving average, a lot like the, the triple Qs, we're still running pretty hot on that. So this is what she's saying. So if you watch Masterclass 6, it talks about technicals and how technicals, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, if you're just joining, algorithms are basically written by humans and humans use historical data to write algorithms. So historical data is con continuously going to repeat itself because it's controlled by robots and computers that run off of algorithms. And the algorithms are written by humans that use data that's historic data. So it's, it's going to follow trends. It's going to follow patterns. It's going to follow moving averages. You know, it's not perfect. There's no magic wand, but it gives you some really good tools to make a better decision. Once you've, you know, if you're buying for a long term, you've done your fundamental analysis, you've looked at all the qualitative and quantitative analysis. Now you're going to take that and you're, you're going to try to get your, the best entry and exit point you can. And that's what the technicals are used for if you're an investor. If you're a trader, you're using this stuff and you're, you, you know, doing short moves, maybe even day trading. So you can use technicals for a lot of different things, but a lot of long-term traders think that technicals aren't important. I disagree. I think 
You need to use technicals even as an investor to get better entry and exit points. It will make a huge difference on the performance of your portfolio over a lifetime. And it'll, it'll be the difference of being able to fly business, you know, coach or first class on every one of your trips when you're retired going to Hawaii on, uh, on vacation, right? So, um, so basically, when I mentioned earlier, she said she'd buy it at, at, at $100 and you laugh. Well, it's not that it's not impossible because $100, what she's looking at is she's looking at the 200 day moving averages and saying, I'm not going to buy it unless it goes back to the moving averages. So that's where she's getting that number. Now, if you look at a chart, this is a, a, one, a one year chart. This goes back to the March lows. So get your time machine, go back in time and buy ARC at $33. Okay. <laughs> if you can do that, that'd be really great. So go ahead and do that now. And, uh, and let me know how many shares you bought. But anyway, $33, and you're, this is called a trend line. This red line is a trend line. You're just drawing from the, the lowest points basically up. And again, you're not using this tool by itself. You're using it in conjunction with all the other stuff we already talked about. So you can see if you just follow the simple trend, it always wants to come back to the trend. It always does because the algorithms are making it. It doesn't mean it will. You can see that sometimes it comes close to this trend line. You see here at $81 and it doesn't quite get there and it goes higher. And then that trend line will actually go higher and your moving averages will go higher as duration happens, as days go by, as time goes on and as the stock goes higher. So it can kind of work itself out of trouble, so to speak, over time by that moving average, you know, moving up. So it doesn't have to come down to this, but it gives you a kind of a line in the sand where it might bounce off. Could it break that line? Yeah, it can break the line too. But you know, if you're using the simple moving average, you're talking about down here at 200, these are pivot points and you can change these pivot points to all kinds of different stuff. I'm not gonna do that right now because it's not necessary for, for the, the purpose of today. But you pretty much can, you know, you take your pointer and say, you know, that thing might come to 118. But if there's enough demand and it's bullish, it might not get to 118. Now this pivot point was 123 and you can see it almost got there. So the low that it really got to is around $125.67. And it's already bounced off of that now and it's at 130. You know, maybe it retests that low, maybe it doesn't. You kind of have an idea of where it might go based on that trend line. Same thing if you look at the other arcs. So you pull up, um, say, arc G. You know, you pull up arc G, you take your trend tool, you do a one year chart, you, you know, this is not nearly as, you know, it's about the same. I mean, they almost look the same, see that? So the same kind of deal, it, it, came, it came down, it kind of bottomed out right on this, on this S1 pivot point at $90. And maybe that's the end of it, maybe not. Maybe it, you know, it comes down. But when you're buying, you can dollar cost average to, to buy your way into a cost basis. You know, I like to buy 25% of the time. So if I want, $20,000 in a stock, I might buy $5,000 and do it over four different days and, you know, and use technicals to determine where it might go. So if I wanted to buy it at 115, I might say, you know, it's running really hot. Like, let's go back in time. Let's say you're looking at a chart and, you know, we go back in time and you're like, I want to buy RG at $115 and say, okay, you can do that. But if you look at this trend line, it's running really hot, like crazy hot. And you look at the moving averages, it's running really hot. So you might want to wait, wait for a little bit of a pullback. Well, a little bit of pullback happens, you know, and then you can, you can take a look at it. You can see it went 98 and then bounced it to 115. And then it kind of, you know, came right back. And a lot of times it'll retest it, retest and break. There's, you know, there's different trends that'll follow. But the point of the exercise I'm trying to show you is this trend line. It's basically, you know that it's going to come back down to earth and it might not come all the way to the red line but it sure as heck's not gonna stay way up in the stratosphere forever. It just doesn't, it just doesn't do it. It could do it for a while until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it goes down fast. So all of these are down 15 to 20%, 18% I think is the average for most of these ARK ETFs. You know, in my opinion, they're, they're good air, you know, spots to, to nibble, to buy shares, but you, you know that it can always go lower. Here's ARK F, same thing, drawing a trend line back to the March lows. Now this one you can see has gotten a lot closer to actually touching this trend line. So, you know, to me, this is an attractive area. If I can get this thing, you know, 50, 52 dollars, it's a good pl place to add. I know it can go lower and I know all the possibilities below it. And that's why I save some cash. I always save, you know, I always have cash, 5% or more. 
And I always have cash ready for these opportunities like we've had this week to take advantage and the dollar cost average into better positions. But you know, you nibble here, you wait. If it comes down, you buy some more. If it doesn't come down and it bounces off, well, it's a high quality problem to have. And you find another opportunity. That's that's as, it's as simple as that. And it sounds, you know, so easy when you when you say it that way. And in your mind, you're like, well, this is, you know, that doesn't make sense. I have to have, you know, a thousand dollars in this. I have to do it now. And you get so fixated on, you know, doing the task of buying the shares to fill your position that you don't, you know, you don't focus on things like this that really could help you get a better deal. And you could say, well, you know, yeah, Eric, but you know, when this thing was at, you know, $42, I wanted to buy it. And I, you know, I could have waited to 36, but you know, now it's actually higher than it was. It's, I could have got it at 42 and it's at 53. I, yeah, that's true. And sometimes you end up averaging up too. But if you're buying all the time when it's way above these trend lines and moving averages, you're not going to perform well. You're just not. So you have to, you have to do your best to try to wait for it to come to you instead of chasing it. You know, no FOMO is what I always say, fear of missing out. I'm going to stop there. That was a lot of talking. Is this helpful at all or should I just go eat, you know, have dinner and watch a movie with my family? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. Cause I think it's fun. But, uh, okay, what do we got? Um, wow, I missed some questions. Hold on. Um, your thoughts on Comcast? Um, you know, Comcast is a quality company. I like Peacock. Um, it's a good, you know, dividend type stock. There's risk there with cord cutting. So I haven't done a ton of, of due diligence on Comcast, but you know, it, it's got potential. Just be aware of the risk there. Uh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate your thoughts. You're welcome. I am long nickel, uranium. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with metals for sure. Um, what do you think about SPCE? We bought that in Discord at uh, 14 and $15 and uh, holding long on that one. Been doing covered calls and having to roll those calls all the time because it keeps going above my strike price. So um, it got a little crazy there for a minute. It's like 62 bucks. But yeah, we bought it at $15 last, you know, what is it, August or whatever it was. And it ran to 62 and it's kind of pulled back. Um, it's a nice spec, spec, you know, cult stock. Um, it's a quality spec. You know, if you're not, if you're not familiar with spec, I like to invest, you know, like 10% of my portfolio in, in what I call spec, which is like speculative and, um, and try to balance those spec stocks with a, a group, a basket of spec. Um, and if, if any of this stuff's interesting to you, like I feel like I talk until my face is blue on the YouTube channel and I make these videos and like not a lot of people watch them. And a lot of it has to do with the algorithm, just not getting it to people. I think sometimes because the stuff I talk about, is not always the trendiest, um, you know, it's not uh, the flavor of the week or the spack of the week or, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I just try to stay to my roots and, you know, and keep doing what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I, I think the people that are in Fired Up Wealth will tell you that it's a unique approach. It's, you know, it's not rocket science, but it's like one of those things where I've been doing it for 20 years. I've kind of learned through trial and error of what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. You know, you're never going to be 100% right on every pick, but if you can maximize your possibilities for risk reward, you'll, you'll outperform consistently. And that's, that's really what it's all about. You'll, you'll make a couple bad picks here and there, but those picks don't, don't really matter that much in the grand scheme of things when, you know, you got 50 picks and two are bad and the rest are good. You know, Peter Lynch was only looking, you know, on bagger stocks, he was looking for six out of 10. Um, so if you can bat, you know, if you're in high growth and you can bat, higher than that, you're, you're probably still outperforming the market pretty, pretty nicely, you know, and even with this, pull, this pullback, I mean, you know, I was up like almost 20% for the year on, on a, you know, I, I have growth in my portfolio, but I also have a lot of really boring stuff too. I've got AT&T and I've got Abvi and I've got Altria and I've got all kinds of income stocks and, you know, net app stuff. That's not hyper growth, you know, so I've got a balance of stuff. Um, and, you know, to go up that much, I mean, we have a pullback and you're still, you know, you could end the year right now at this number and it would be, you know, it would be the average of what the S&P 500 gets over a period. Obviously, our goal is to always outperform that number, but you have to have perspective too. 
the, the ones that don't have perspective are the ones that are buying these at 63 and then it comes back to 55 and they're, you know, they feel a lot of pain. That's, that's what you want to avoid. That's where discipline comes in. Oh, wow. Whew. I bought uh, one share of Tesla at 400. Nice work. Uh, subscribed. Well, thank you. So good explanation on where to buy stocks. Have to learn drawing those trend lines. I don't think they're hard, but I also will tell you that, you know, it takes time just looking at charts because it's not just the trend line either. Like if I just use this trend line to buy, to buy stocks, it would not work. I have to use fundamentals. I have to use RSI. I've got to use moving averages. But here's what I'll say. You know, if, okay. So if I look at say a hundred day moving average and I say, you know, ARC, there's so much interest on this. It's probably not going to go much lower than 125. And if you look, by the way, the low, the, if you look at ARC, we pull ARC back up the ARKK. What was the low on that one again? Oh, magic. It literally hit $125. Okay. That's called an algorithm. <laughs> you know, it's literally hitting that range within cents and it's going to bounce off of it. If the market goes really bad and things get really, really bad, then you're going to see this next drop down. And now as you get better with technicals, you'll incorporate, you know, things like Fibonacci's and that's just using kind of like history and trends, retracements. And you say, okay, well, you know, 126. So the algorithm might be programmed to use, you know, the, the, the average of the exponential moving average on a growth stock or even ETF, like in this case, and taking the average of the Fibonacci off of the, the P, right, the par, take, or this is the S1. So, you know, it, it could be using the S1, whatever. I'm just trying to use a hypothetical. But it could be taking like, depending on how the algorithm is written, it could take a Fibonacci S1, plus the exponential moving of 100 and use the average and that might get you 125.50 or whatever the number is and you go look and it's like right there you know and it's you know i'm making a, an observation where it's, it's not like all every single buy and sell is an algorithm but these big institutional investors are and i've got friends in the industry so you know i do have some insight into how some of this stuff works and they're programmed by algorithms that basically use this kind of information in a quick manner why do you think when we have these sell-offs, when they have those snapbacks, like on Tuesday, when we, you know, the market opens and all of a sudden it's just like, blah, everything's like going crazy. And some of you are sitting there like a deer, deer in the headlights. Oh, what do I buy? Uh, you know, oh my God, I don't have a watch list. I didn't prepare last night. I, you know, I was watching Seinfeld and I don't know what the hell to do. And maybe you get one order in or whatever. And then you look up and everything's already back, back you know, back off the bottom. And you're like, oh my goodness, like what was that? Well, that's called an algo washout. It literally is like, it, it, the computer is faster than we are and it can just go boom. And it's like, oh, it got to that range. Now we're going to buy it. It just flips the switch right back the other direction. And that's where uh, we've, we've been trained over the years to buy the dip, you know, buy the dip because you, it's man versus machine. And if you trade, like I do some active trading too, you'll learn quickly that you're, you know, the odds are against you because you're going against machines and algorithms and market makers and all kinds of different stuff. But as a long-term investor, you don't have to be perfect. And that's what's, the, that's what's beautiful, beautiful about it. If you believe that a stock is going to be worth more in five years, yes, you want to try to get a little bit better entry point. But is it going to matter if you get it at 135 or 125? It sure does in the short term because it can hurt really bad if you bought it at 135 and it goes to 125 and you have that whole, oh, I should have done this. I could have, should have, would have. And that's one of the top 50 investing rules. No, could have, should have, would have. You know, you got to remove the emotion from investing and trading to say, I'm making this decision. If it goes lower, I buy more. I'm a robot, you know. But the point being, in, in five years, you might not remember that you've got it at 135 instead of 125 when it's trading at 250 or whatever, right? So that's, that's the thing to remember. I mean, it does make a difference over time, but don't beat yourself up because you're never going to perfectly time that bottom. You, you're you're going to try your best. And so what I do is I take this, this information I'm showing you here, and then when I'm ready to buy, I go over to Act, uh, Fidelity Active Trader Pro, and then I use a two-day chart, five-minute candles. And you know the masterclass is going to go into more candles and a lot of the, the short-term chart reading. That's the kind of chart reading you use for active trading, for day trading, for swing trading. And I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm good at, you know, the long-term investing point and I'm really good at the day trading. The swing trading is not my area of expertise. And, and honestly, there's so many things that can change swing trading 
it's it's the less the least successful of the two. You don't have to be perfect on long term and short term if you understand just you know candles and you're scalping candles and things. It's not really that hard if you know what you're doing to make a couple bucks. You just have to be really disciplined and not get greedy when you're doing those moves. Now I always say don't you know be a, a trader and don't don't be a day trader. But I can't stop you. And I say if you do it, make it a separate account, make it a small part of your assets. If you lose that money, you're done. You've got your your main portfolio over here that's long term. You've got your play money over here. You know, if you're going to do it, be disciplined about it. Don't be day trading with, you know, your retirement or that money that you really, really need later on. Um, that's, that's what I would suggest to you. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just telling you what works for me. I've seen a lot of people lose a lot of money over my lifetime. And I've also seen a lot of retail traders come and go. It's rinse and repeat, guys. You know, the market gets excited. You get fork. Everybody's like, you know, your, your neighbor is telling you about a hot stock to buy. Everybody's, you know, b bullish. And that's when it gets bad. When everybody and their mother tells you to buy a stock or to buy this or that, that's usually the top of the froth. You know, you have a sell off and I don't think we're there yet. It, I think it'll happen at some point. I don't know when, but you're going to have that. You're going to have people that are in a lot of pain that don't recover. They, you know, they get disgruntled. They leave wall street. They say wall street's against me. They're there to take my money. They never come back and then time goes on until a new breed of, of investor comes in. They get their money taken, rinse and repeat. So don't, don't be one of those people. All you got to do, buy quality and hold it long term. It's not rocket science, you know. But when I say quality, it doesn't mean go fill a portfolio with, with 20 spec stocks because that's not what I'm talking about or 20 penny stocks. You know, be diversified in different secular growth trends, be diversified in the type of stocks you own, have a few, a few blue chips, have some, you know, large cap, you know, throw in some Apple in there and some Microsoft, mix it in with some DraftKings, you know, like ha have some variety, different industries, different market caps, different types of stocks. You know, we talk about the different kinds of stocks and how those stocks act. Understand, you know, your stocks are like players on a team. You know, if, if you've ever played sports, I played college football. You've got a bunch of players on a team and they're all different. They have different skill sets. Some are the strong, you know, big, strong guys that, you know, have to block the receivers that have to catch and score touchdowns, the quarterback, you know, all different players. You can use any sport you want. But every player has the strengths and weaknesses. And together you take all those different strengths and weaknesses. It could be intangible or tangible assets. And that makes a team. And you need a perfect balance of all of those attributes to make a perfect team to win a championship. You know, in order to win a championship, you have to have chemistry and your portfolio is just like a team. It has to have chemistry, has to work together for a common goal. It might sound, you know, kind of tacky or whatever, but it's true. If you think about it, you know, your, um, your income stocks, and you, you might not be at the age where you need income stocks, but you've got some Costco's of the world that are going to give you a little bit of dividend and some safety, some kind of staples type, you know, stock. You're going to have some, you know, Amazons to kind of balance out that large cap growth. You're going to have some small cap spec type growth. You're going to have all these different players. You know, this one is a star receiver to score my touchdowns. That's my hyper growth. But, you know, this bad boy here, my Apple or, you know, whatever you want to use as an example, you know, this is, this is the one that I can sleep well at night knowing that no matter what happens, like I'm not worried about this stock because, you know, this is my, this is the center of my whole line and he's always got my back. You know, he's always going to be there and I can rely on him, you know? Um, so anyway, that's my analogy for the day. Could you look at QQQ? Yes. What do you think? Do you think there are attractive investments in SaaS? Yeah, a lot of them have been buying some. Uh, following you since the beginning, always top quality, love it. Greetings from Germany. Hello, Dylan. Good question by Gene. Good question indeed. Um, QQQ. So here is a QQQ. It broke trend. So we can just get rid of that bad boy. And you can see that if you drew that trend line back to March, Again, a trend line does not mean that it has to bounce off of that. It's just a line in the sand, and it can certainly break that line. If you drew this trend line, it's kind of broken to begin with because 
you know, it doesn't really have, it's just kind of a messy one. So I look at a trend line like this, I'm like, eh, it's not perfect. But, you know, again, you look at it, it slightly broke it, and here we are. It's kind of fighting on that line. It doesn't mean it's going to hold it, but uh, it's really interesting when you look at those trend lines, how they, you know, they sometimes break it. Sometimes they break it and snap right back above that line into that channel. You know, it's actually up after hours, 0.18. So that's actually not a terrible sign. You know, nice little dip. Is it expensive? Absolutely, it's expensive. Let's look at the technicals. I'll show you what I'm talking about. So here's the thing, right? So we're at 314, right? And we got our low was, what did we get to? We got, I don't know, 310-ish, 309-ish. So we, we almost got to the 100-day. And I kept saying in Discord, I'm like, I wish it would just touch the 100-day. Because I feel like the algo wants to touch it all, you know, and if it doesn't, then, you know, things will go up and then the algo has to touch that. It's like it has to touch the 100 day before it can go higher. And so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, next week we rally it up and then all of a sudden we crash back down. We have super, you know, we have really high volatility. So you'll see this all the time. And I'm not saying it'll happen. I can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just telling you what I've seen before. But it wants to hit 305, 306. And if it doesn't, I'm always kind of like, eh, boy. <laughs> because it, you know, statistically, there's a good chance that still happens. What I wanted to show you, though, if you get out a calculator and do the math and you figure out 314, you know, we're still at the low. We were about 10 percent above the 200 day, 200 day moving average. That means that in order to come back down to a 200 day moving average, you know, you could drop 10 more percent to get to that line. And the arc was, you know, like that too, where we're, we're at, we're at the hundred day, but we're not the 200 day. It doesn't mean we have to go to the 200 day. It does not mean that. But for me, I always feel more confidence when something does come to the 200 day, because the statistical chance that it's going to wash out there and go higher is, is higher than if it's, uh, you know, just at the hundred day. So when you buy at the hundred day, or if you buy the 50 day or the 20 day, whatever, I never really buy at the 10, 20 or 30. I don't usually even buy at the 50 unless there's some, you know, anomaly reason. The 100 is where I might nibble knowing that there's a chance it goes to the 200 and then I would, you know, add aggressively, you know, as it goes down basically to fill in my, my position and, and improve my cost basis. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, what are your top picks for semiconductors? Um, you know, I've got a whole series on semiconductors that you might want to check out. Um, I like the names that you're mentioning. Um, I've been in LAM for since 2016. I've been in NVIDIA since 130 bucks. I have a little AMD, um, Marvell. I've got several videos on. We're buying that in discord at 40 and 35. I have a top five, um, top five growth stock videos for 2021. Marvell's on that one too. So uh, if you're new to the channel, definitely check it out. It sounds like there'll be some videos that'll be down your alley, but uh, but I like all those. I mean, the thing about semiconductors is that people like to group semiconductors together, and it's actually not correct. Um, you can group them together as an you know industry or sector, but you can't compare AMD to Marvell. They're completely different. You know, one is actually in your DJIF bucket, and one's in your growth bucket. So, you know, Marvell is a really good DJIF but you don't compare Marvell to AMD and people do that all the time. But like, that's just not how I build my portfolios. And I think if you use that mindset, it helps you because you are not going to get the same growth from the same types of stock. Lamb research, you know, paying you a one and a half percent dividend or whatever it's paying you right now. Uh, LRCX. And I'm up, you know, 300% on this stock. And there are some good ones out there that are kind of up and comers and it's a 27 P you know, so it's, it's, it's gone up a lot, right? It's gone up a lot. It still pays you a 1% dividend yield though. And so a stock paying a 1% yield is at a different part of their growth stage. You know, so you think of a growth stock, you think of, uh, you know, um, CrowdStrike, they're not paying a dividend. They're using every single dollar to reinvest back in the business. And that's going to give you as an investor, it's going to give you, the best chance for growth of the company and growth of the share appreciation. As the company grows, like Apple, they have so much cash they don't know what to do with. The government won't let them buy anything because it's called a monopoly and they, they intervene. And so at some point, they have to start buying shares back and then paying investors with dividends. And then the dividend you know, comes out at a small dividend and then they slowly increase the dividend as, you know, as that's, that growth story unfolds. NVIDIA pays a small dividend at 0.12%. And as they mature, 
they're going to pay more and more dividend. So when you have a stock paying a 7% dividend like uh, Altria, what does that tell you? It tells you that, that they're at the peak of their growth. They're there to pay you at income and that you should have tempered expectations of the growth of the share price. You know, you can buy Altria and say, you know, it's undervalued and I think there is upside potential, but understand that it's a mature income stock. You're not buying in the portfolio for growth. So I'm not buying Lamb Research for the same reason that I'm buying, you know, a small cap semiconductor that no, no one's ever heard of that's a billion dollars. And there's a couple of those that I've bought in Discord that have done really well. So, I mean, there, you have to, I think, in my opinion, you have to categorize not only by industry, but you also need to categorize by the buckets within your portfolio, which I think helps you dissect what the portfolio is and what the purpose of each stock, each team member, each asset is within the overall uh, portfolio strategy. Uh, no, 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 no. You guys got some tough questions. Um, what's your opinion on ARC? So you must have just joined uh, in the beginning. And this will be recorded, so you can certainly go. I encourage you. I think there's probably a lot of great information in this hour. Um, an hour and 10 minutes. And I'm giving you a lot of really good high-level stuff that you know I share with my, my Discord and Patreon team and through the masterclass and all that. And I'm not trying to push it. I really am not. I'm just you know trying to explain that this is what we do and how we're, we're trying to teach people to invest the right way um, you know, through trial and error and what works. Um, but to go back to it, I have most of my retirement is, is in ETFs, and I do have quite a bit in ARC ETFs. My, uh, my heaviest weight in ARC is ARC uh, W, and then it's going to be um, G and then it's K and then it's F and I don't own any Q. Not that I don't like it. I just don't have any. Of it. Um, thoughts on Tesla. I have a video on Tesla. I bought it before it kind of took off. Um, you know, it's a good stock. It's expensive. It's, it can grow into its valuation. I mean, I think, you know, enough about Tesla. I mean, Elon Musk and the whole retail trade behind it and helped expedite that company and make it, you know, it really ex, ex, you know, expedited their ability to get in the S&P 500. You know, EV is a huge trend. They've got a big piece of that. I would not, you know, I would not rule out some of the legacy vendors like GM. I don't own any, you know, I own Tesla. I don't own GM or Ford or anything. But just know that they are going to focus a lot of money and attention. And when governments say you have to have all EV, you know, that you can't have any gas-powered motor, motor vehicles by 2030, you know, Toyota and Honda and, and all the other companies, they don't, they don't really have much choice, right? So just, just realize, I mean, I think Tesla is going to have a good market share and I think they've got a really solid cult following, but just understand that there's a lot of opportunity in that space and not just by buying the car stocks, you know, you could buy chip stocks like NVIDIA, Texas Instruments. There's a lot of different chip stocks that are used in sensors in cars for autonomous the whole internet of things, you know, kind of connects all this stuff together. And I, I have a series on the channel about semiconductors, the new oil, and it talks about how semiconductors really power everything. And it's what oil was to our economy 50 years ago. Semiconductors are now uh, not that energy is not important because you need energy to run semiconductors, <coughs> but you say, well, big data is, is the, the new oil. No, you can't use you can't have big data without semiconductors. You know, yeah. you can't have cloud computing without semiconductors. You can't have five G. You can't have Alexa devices. You can't have the stream. You can't have the phone that you're looking at. You can't have any of this stuff. This microphone, this camera, um, your kids' toys, your iPad, whatever. Look around you. Look around you right now, and wherever you're at, your car. Heck, even your car, even if it's not autonomous, has tons of microchips. Some of the new EVs have a hundred microchips, or, or uh, you know, semiconductors. And you think of the, uh, the whole shortage right now, of course, right? You're, you're building more and more cars, plus semiconductors are using everything, and you've got this, this, this shortage of, uh, of supply. It makes a lot of sense. And, uh, not to, you know, and then within semiconductors, you got to look at the semiconductor manufacturers as well. So LAM Research is you know, a manufacturer versus you know, NVIDIA, which is making more of the end product, and they're diversified through you know, autonomous and, you know, video gaming and even, you know, cryptocurrency mining, all those different things. So, <clears throat> um, fantastic info. Thank you. Wish I had a good question. Don't want to say thanks for doing this 
as every Friday. Thanks, Joe. Um, VW took a lot of EV market share quick. That's what I'm alluding to. See, I have to be careful how I say stuff, but that's kind of what I was, you know, I'm alluding to the fact that these big companies like General Motors and Ford aren't going to soon roll over and die, you know? So do I like Tesla? Yes, but just don't, don't, um, don't be oblivious to the competition is all I'm saying. Just, you know, keep, keep an eye on that. Uh, I like Tesla, but uh, you know, there's some guys that I talked to recently that are, you know, 40% of their portfolios in Tesla. That's just, in my opinion, that's not the right way to do it. At the end of the day, you can do whatever you want with your money, but you got to understand that risk reward there. And, you know, for me, it's just not worth it. Um, so just make sure you, you build your portfolio based on your risk, risk tolerance. I like to have lots of different holdings and hedge them. And people say you can't outperform that way. But, you know, the Magellan Fund with, with Peter Lynch, he would have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 holdings and, and, and destroy the S&P every year. So, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. The people that tell you you have to have this many stocks, it's wrong. Like, the answer is there is no answer. You can, you can have five stocks. You can have 100 stocks. It's really what you can manage and what you're comfortable with. That's where really all, all it comes down to. Anybody that tells you otherwise, I mean, it's just wrong, you know, because investing is individual. What's right for me, you know, you might be able to take parts of things that I do and incorporate into your own strategy. But at the end of the day, you have to have your own strategy. So you're going to tweak it and make it your own, right? Um, I always say learn from others, you know, learn from me and other people and make your own path. Make sure it fits your your goals, your suitability, your risk tolerance, your age, all those different things. Okay, I think that's it. I'm losing my voice. For, well, that was an hour and 16 minutes. Was that useful at all, or should I do these more often? What do you guys think? Nothing? Uh, Nokia, please. I have no idea. I would avoid Nokia. That's just my personal opinion. Somewhat useful. So Chairman Kim, what could we have done to, to make you happier? There's always that one person, right? That, you know, it's never, you cannot, no matter what you do in life, you're never going to please everybody. And, you know, there's the, the YouTube haters out there. I'm getting more used to it. I just realized the ones that are doing that, you know, you're never going to make them happy. It's just the way it is. So if you please 99 out of 100, I think you're doing pretty darn good. All right, guys. I appreciate your time and attention. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Check out the channel. Subscribe. Check out in the comments. Please drop a comment once this is over. You can watch the video again. There's a link for uh, how to subscribe. There's a link to Patreon. There's a link to the merchandise, to all the different platforms if you want to take a look. So if you're interested in joining our Discord or our Patreon, you know, I'm not here to, to try to sell you hard on it, but the information is in the comments um, below. So take a look. But I appreciate it, guys. I hope you have a good weekend.